What's up, powerful nonsenses? How's it going? We're back for another episode, episode 107. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually really looking forward to this one. I'm kind of it's intrigued bit of a, to where it's going to go. Yeah, me too. Bit of a different episode uh, this week, because uh, we're talking future stuff. Mm. Which we've done one episode before on with guest John Danaher. But we have talked about it a lot in the past episodes here yeah. and there, but we're kind of going to try to pull everything together on this yeah. one. Uh, so this is going to be, this is something that me and you always talk about. We're geeks. We are geeks. <laughs> so uh, it felt only right that we kind of did an episode about it and just kind of go for a little free flow kind of discussion about where we think stuff's going to go. So what are we talking about, Wayne? Uh, So I thought it might be interesting to talk about um, the baby boomer generation shifting into the millennial generation. Sounds very fancy. Uh, Which uh, Daniel Priestley's talked about. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe it's in his Key Person of Influence book. Yeah, and in his Entrepreneurial Revolution Mm -hmm. book as well. But also a lot of, obviously, Seth Godin talks a lot about this. in, In all his books, Stop Stealing Dreams, especially when he talks about that whole revolution industrial age how we're changing and mm-hmm. so a lot of people in that entrepreneurial space are already talking about this stuff yeah so i mean the the general concept is that um in the 60s was the birth of the baby boomer generation which then started to shift into the millennial generation uh in the late 80s mm-hmm. into the early 2000s which is if you're mine and gems age or kind of 10 years either side is probably where you're at. Mm-hmm. Um, and the shift is about this fact that the baby boomers are just starting to hit retirement age, which means that the baby, bo- baby boomers are going to stop being the key, Im- key influencers mm-hmm. uh, in the way that the world works, and the millennial generation is going to start taking over, um, which I think raises a lot of interesting questions when you think about the millennial mindset and how we see the world as a generation which is much less um, solid money driven. I mean, obviously, there's still a lot of like financial incentives for people to be successful. But I think I think as a generation, we seem to be much more liberal thinking. We think a lot more in terms of, well, how can we actually change the world for the better? That's not to say that the baby boomer generation didn't do that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very high on our priority list. And we're not so worried about uh, necessarily whether we own our own home because we've kind of accepted we might not own our own home ever and and those sorts of things. Yeah, I think, especially for the millennial generation anyway, I think we're like the awareness generation. Yes, I, I think, think that's a good way of putting I it. I think yeah. the reason why we're so, like, not so fussed about maybe money, owning your own house is because we now have a understanding. Like, obviously, there's so much content out there. There's so much, obviously, the internet mm-hmm. means we can access information so widely. And I think that's the thing. We become so aware of issues or problems of ways that things were done I think we can question things more than ever now and I think that's where our whole generation especially the millennials are kind of like shaken up at the moment because all the rules that were there before are now being questioned and then suddenly Mm -hmm. people are looking at the rules and saying wait this rule makes no sense why have we been doing it that way and Uh I think because of that every rule is being smashed in whatever way possible Mm -hmm. and now it's kind of like well we like rules, so how do we now set some new ones? Right. And I think that's kind of where we're at at the moment, especially. It's that idea that we're so sho- shaken up and we're kind of looking for what's what's new. It's a lot, I think we've spoke about it before. I think it's a lot of the reasons why we find a lot of the millennial generation are getting mental health issues. It's because mm. our realities are being questioned. And I think everybody's looking for a new kind of guidance on what to do next. But I think that the problem there is actually this freedom means that we can be very flexible. Yeah. And I think we're not used to living in a flexible world where we now have more power. And in some ways, it's scary to have the power, to have the choice, to make the decision, to choose which path you go on. It means there's no longer a go here and that's where you that's the right way to do it. Yeah, there's there's no longer a if you want to be rich and successful, become a lawyer. Or if you want to own a house (laughs) and have a family, do this. And I think there's that's the thing. It's like for us, we see it as a massive opportunity, mm-hmm. but I think for a lot of people, it's a, it's a fear. It's like, well, I kind of like knowing what the next path was. I kind of like knowing what I should study next, and it's now, well, that's been blown apart, yeah. and we can see that even my, my like my younger brother, you can see that it's all being shaken up. They're questioning schooling. They're already questioning yeah. it in secondary school. Is this yeah. what I should be doing? What a waste yeah. of time. I've already watched a YouTube video about this businessman who made his business. He left school at 13, and it's like, we didn't have access to that information. No. Well, I, well, I, well mm, it's interesting because I think we did, but I think um, 
we, we, I think, are actually at the interesting age, at people that were born in the late 80s, where we actually saw, we lived through the shift. I don't, I, I, think I, think I think we're in the shift, though. I think we're in the shift. I mean, we are in the shift, but I think your younger brother, I mean, how old is your younger brother? 16? Yeah. So I think, I mean, there's, what, 10 years difference between you and your younger brother, and I think that 10 years difference is a huge difference. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, that's the difference between being born... Uh, what year was he born? Probably just before the 2000s, is that? Okay, so yeah. like well, 98, 99, something like that? Well, yeah, so like 10 years on, so yeah, yeah 98, 99. Right, yeah. and I was born 89, mm-hmm. and the world was a very different place between 89 and 99. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the internet was starting to really take off, um, and, and like mobile phones were just a thing when your brother was born. They were just a thing that everybody had by that point, whereas for 10 years... Only business people had a mobile phone mm-hmm. when I was a kid, so I think that that makes a huge difference. But anyway, um, so I think, but I think what's interesting is the fact that the generation is now starting to question schooling. That I think is the real big shift because I think when when the generation starts looking at all of the rules, all of the systems that are in place, and go, well, hang on, there's got to be a better way than this. And I think that's what the generation as a whole is doing. And I think a lot of the reason for that was, God, I can't believe it was nearly 10 years ago, but when the the, uh, global economy crashed, Mm -hmm. I think that was the wake-up call for so many people of our generation of going, well, hang on. like, Why did this happen? (laughs) Yeah, why has this happened? It's happened because the systems are flawed and, and everything that we're told we're supposed to do doesn't necessarily work. And that generation have done it and they failed, so how can we make things better? And then also, because there's no money there, at least it seems, it requires a little bit of innovation. And so the people of our age that are just starting to make a way for themselves in adult life then start going, okay, well, I don't want that to happen when I'm in my 50s and I'm ready to retire. I don't want to lose all my money, so how can I make sure that I'm actually being fulfilled beyond money? And I think that's where things really shifted. I think if you look at all of the ingredients that have brought about the millennial generation and and their way of thinking, um, it's obvious that there's going to be... It's it's a rebellious... I mean, I, I know it, probably every generation says that, like, because mm. the baby boomers lived through the 60s and the 70s, which was a little bit rebellious. So you had the punk movement and the hippie movement and all that sort of stuff. But it's it's the, the point at which the generation then starts to rebel against whatever the previous generation had rebelled about and then came to a conclusion of this is how we're supposed to do it, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. I just think as well that that whole consciousness that the millennials are having or young people like my brother, it's like they are questioning the things about life so much earlier. Yes, yes, yes. Literally. Exactly. like, And because there's the awareness of it, like we didn't feel we could question. I think maybe it's why people have midlife crisis so later on because they get to a point where they've lived so much and they've collected all this wisdom and then they question life and then mm-hmm. suddenly they're like, well, I didn't need the house, didn't need the marriage, didn't need the car, uh, and, now, and then they have to go back. Whereas actually, I think it's going so much earlier. It's the 16-year-olds, it's the 14-year-olds, the 15-year-olds are watching stuff on social media videos mm-hmm. popping up, and they're questioning it straight away. They're like, well, my mum and dad are divorced, and right. they've lost their house, and they're going through right. this, and they've got debt to pay. They're always moaning about money. It's like, well, they've done something wrong. And I think right. it's also a struggle for the young people in that sense because they are now seeing that the people they look up to, you look up to your elders and they've done it wrong, like you say, or things haven't worked out perfect for them and now they're stuck in this, well, how am I going to do it? And But then I yeah. think the, the thing that we're trying to share with people is the idea that kind of, it's, it's a lot about self-development, it's all about self-awareness and I think that's what mm. young people are probably going through very early on now is actually highlighting that ego, highlighting um, problems and kind of being able to, I don't know. It's it's really really tough actually for young people when you think about yeah, it. I think so. And I mean, your brother always comes up in conversation with us, your younger brother, and how much he's struggling because he makes more money <laughs> doing what he does than most people, most kids his age make at a weekend. Yeah. So he, my brother's a YouTuber, and obviously he makes I don't know seven eight hundred pound a month. I know I had a paper round. I think I earned thirty quid right. <laughs> for the week, and I had yeah. to work seven days a week and be up. Thirty quid for a paper round. It was literally like was that a quid. big paper round? I had to do it. Feels e- like it must have been a big paper round. I had to do it every single day, every oh, morning, okay. and it was like um, I can't even remember those Sunday bags when the papers were about this big. I was just like <laughs> my back. I think that's why my back's so strong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to balance on my bike, but yeah. Yeah. 
paper round's going to die, isn't it? I think. Oh, I feel rounds. like paper round's going to go. Well, I think as the generation shifts, I think the oldies are obviously still yeah. getting their papers, but obviously now a lot of it's going digitised anyway. So, And that was like, do you remember the fundamental kind of like you hit like 12, 13? It's like, go get a paper round. Oh, I had a paper round. I, I never did. I, I helped my mates do a paper round. I was I doing it in year own. seven since I was about 12 or mm-hmm. whatever, how old you are in year seven. <laughs> anyway, anyway, back to the point. <laughs> <laughs> um... But yeah, so I think what's going to be interesting is how when the millennials start having the high positioned jobs where the world's going to start changing. I think I had a conversation with you the other week about the whole energy thing. The millennial generation, I think, are the ones going, well, why are we not like putting solar panels on roofs? Mm -hmm. Like, it makes complete sense. And actually, actually, saying that... uh, the date we're recording this, the Apple event was on yesterday, right? And they have done pretty much everything that I've said everybody should be doing for renewable energy. They have gone 100% renewable in the United States. All of their operations use renewable energy. Um, and It's been a long while since you got your Apple plug in. I know, it has. Go so on, here it is. Hit, enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, their their renewable energy ratio is so ridiculously high. I think... I think overall, as a company across the world, they're 93% renewable, right? How have they done it? They've taken city blocks and put solar panels on the city blocks. Mm-hmm. They have create, created solar farms, which a lot of people are like, yeah, but you don't want to you know, ruin the environment by building solar farms. They've put their solar panels on stilts. That's mm-hmm. it. That's it. Mm-hmm. And it's just kind of like... And I've always been like, well, you know, why are the energy companies not doing this simple stuff, which makes complete and utter sense. And my gut feeling is it's about money. Yeah, but I also think as well, I think a lot of these companies are doing these changes because it's the same reason why somebody slams organic on a label. It is marketing, ultimately. It's to say, okay, you're an ethical company. And I think that we've heard it before, people vote with their dollars. And I think nowadays... They know that their market is these millennials who are going to be the first people right. into the product. Right. And the millennial is saying, well, did you test this on animals? Did you, is this made uh, ethically right. friendly? Um, do you use renewable energy? Is, is your product recycled? And I think that comes from the awareness that before the generation before, they didn't have to think about that. Right. And before they would just be like, well, I've got my product, it's cheap, end of. Exactly. Whereas it about, now, it's I, again what I was saying about it's about being that money thing. Whether, whereas the previous generation, it was like, how can we make things as cheap as possible and sell them as high as yeah, possible? That's the industrial mindset. Just right. bolt by, make it cheap, have one type of product. And... Right. Whereas the millennial generation goes, OK, how can I make money, but make sure that I'm doing it in an ethical way and mm-hmm. in, a, in a way that makes the world better than I found it mm-hmm. kind of thing? And I think that's the significant difference. And I think where you're going to see some big shifts um, right, we're about halfway through the episode. Already. We've talked millennials, oh <laughs> the millennial generation. So I think we'll come back and we'll talk about where we think things are going to go. So we need to thank our sponsor, the University of Northampton. These guys have been great to us and great to you because them sponsoring us means we can continue doing this, right? Yep. Right? So uh, the University of Northampton... Uh, specialise in social enterprise. So they're all about degrees, obviously, because that's what unions do, but they're also very, very interested in getting their graduates to set up businesses, particularly in the social enterprise space, which is all about business doing social good. So if you're thinking, yeah, I want a degree, but I also want to set up my own business, then I highly recommend, we highly recommend, as alumni, that you check them out. So head over to northampton.ac.uk. All the information is there. And we'd like to thank them very much for their support of the show. So we have decided a lot has changed as we've been working on this podcast slash YouTube channel. I mean, for one thing, YouTube, right? So we now want to talk to you guys to find out how we can deliver more value to you. Because this is for you. It's not for us. We know this stuff. It's a little bit for us. It's a little bit for us. We enjoy it. (laughs) But the reason we put this content out is for you guys. So we want to know how we can help you guys better. So we've put together a two-question survey. Two questions. It should take you two minutes. (laughs) Don't even think two minutes. True. You could probably do it in 30 seconds, right? So we would really appreciate it if you just headed on over there 
powerfulnonsense.com forward slash you. We'll put the link in the video if you're watching on YouTube. Um, and we'd just love you to go over there, just answer those two questions. It's really, really quick, just so that we can provide as much value to you as possible. So head on over there and answer them questions. Back to the show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Hello. Uh, so. I can't believe how quick that first half went. No, me neither. Sorry if we babbled on a bit. I feel like we may have been in flow a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Something was flowing. Yeah. <laughs> but we're back. And we're talking about the future. And we spent the first half talking about the millennial generation and how that's that shift is going to change things. Going to continue. Going to try to mm -hmm. find the ways. Yeah. The many ways. <laughs> the, me the many millennial ways. Oh, God, that was really hard to say. Mm. Many millennial ways. Anyway, anyway, uh, so now we're going to talk about where we think things are going to significantly shift. So based on our limited experiences obviously, and knowledge, obviously, <laughs> we are not. We haven't been to the future. We haven't got in our time machine and headed back and gone. Here's our, here's what we discovered. We haven't done that, although I wish we could. So, Gem. <laughs> yes. Gut instinct. Gut instinct. What do you think is going to be the next big disruption the thing that's going to like change everything i think we don't really need to guess to be honest because i think it's already <laughs> happening so okay. that's why i'm already going to look at what's happening now i think are we going to get into a debate about this one i feel like we might <laughs> we always get into debates why not <laughs> no but i think the the main thing we're already seeing and it's kind of happening massively is obviously technology but mm -hmm. i think it's the use of technology for automation mm -hmm. which is this whole idea that what they call it techn uh, technological unemployment obviously we know this is mm -hmm. happening there's statistics being flying flying around all over the place. You've got the types of jobs that are going. You've got fintech. You've got people are saying by 2020, 50% of finance jobs. I might have made up that stat, but it's something no, like no, that. No, it's, it's bigger than that. So the BBC have done a study yeah. about the likelihood of certain jobs being automated mm -hmm. within the next 20 years. Yeah. Right? This is one of my favourite stats because I think this shows, <laughs> this shows the difference. He's memorised it, so it must be important. This shows the difference, I think, between what we're saying about the baby boomer generation and the millennial generation and, and not necessarily the perspectives, but I always, when I bring this one up, I always say to people, if you're, if you're told, if you say to your parents or whatever that you really want to make money, you want to go into a career where you're really going to make money. One of the top things that's going to come up is be an accountant. Mm -hmm. Because accountants are well paid. My accountant's well paid. <laughs> um, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately for me, yeah. But accountants are well paid. The BBC study, and we'll link it up because we've got the link, so you can see it and type in whatever your occupation is. But the BBC study reckons that there is a approximately, I might be taking a couple of percent away, but approximately... 95% chance that accountants are going to be automated within 20 years. Yeah, and I think this is going to happen to loads of industries. I think what's happening is that people are saying anything that can be done in a systemized fashion mm -hmm. will be automated because it makes no sense to have a human doing it. Humans need to do the parts that actually maybe have a lot more alternative options that can happen. Mm -hmm. That's why, obviously, Seth Godin talks about we have this sort of creativity crisis. We need people who can think, is it laterally? Laterally? Oh, God. I think so. That sounds right. Yeah. It's people who can think in different, like, dynamics, not just have a one system. It's not about screwing a top on top of a toothpaste anymore. Right. It's these, and so I think... Because humans don't provide any value doing that, really. Not really. And I think you can see it now, we say, with the self-checkouts in supermarkets, we, we say in our talk. We also talk about that. Like, McDonald's have just, like, bought loads of systemized ways where people can just walk up and... It's like Argus for fast food. Yeah, exactly. And I think these kind of jobs are just going to start to fizzle away. Mm -hmm. quickly equip more as quick as possible and i think companies are now saying well it's more they they're saving money because they can automate a task but at the same time they're saying well actually are we not freeing up people from all these really shitty jobs mm -hmm. but then it also means that maybe certain types of people people say certain class of people certain educational levels of people need those jobs and obviously that's where there could be a crisis in that sense yeah that these low barrier to entry jobs are often the ones that are actually automated first. Yes. And that's the danger there. It's kind mm. of, we talked about in a few podcasts back about being a key person of influence. Nowadays, it's there. we know there's any old jobs out there for anyone, the quick entry level, minimum wage jobs, but actually, usually it's those jobs that are automated first because they're usually low skilled. They're usually like, um, kind of like mundane tasks that just have to be done over and over and over again. Yeah. It's admin, it's adding in digits, and these sort of jobs are the ones that we know are gonna be automated. And it's happening faster and faster. The technology is getting better and better. And we know that there's software coming out every single day that's automating a part of your life. And yeah. you did talk about like how Apple are now getting into the health space because they know that actually a lot of the data that we need you, to... You I know, I'm sorry about this. 
<laughs> we know that obviously getting into the health space, there's a lot of data out there that's available that you don't need to go to your doctors to get to find yeah. out if something's going yeah. wrong. And how do you automate the tracking of somebody's health? Obviously, they've got the watch now. Mm -hmm. Look at this plug. I can't believe it. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. A lot of these things are happening in all kinds of fields. Like you said, with the account, and we know that we use software online now yeah. to manage our accounts. Yeah. It's really simple. So it's going to keep happening. All these jobs are going to fall away. And I think it is going to become really difficult. I know um, John Danner has spoke about this. There's maybe going to be lots of people out of work. Do we bring in that minimum wage for everybody? Mm. How do people spend their time if there's not enough jobs to go around? I know everyone's like, oh, it's a massive crisis. This is terrible. But it's things that are actually happening. If you look in your life now, there's that one person at the self-checkout who just oversees what would have been 12 staff, which is now just 12 machines. Yeah. We know the, automa true, we yeah. know the automated car is coming. So now we don't need a car. And or I a think, taxi. Or a taxi. We know they're going to be automated in the future. And it's kind of... This is where it's going. I think people would rather think about that when it comes, but I think yeah. people don't realise it's already here. Yes. And I think that's the danger, and that's where we want to share this stuff because we know it's happening. Mm -hmm. How many people we know in that millennial generation are fed up with their work because they are doing those monotonous tasks, which may eventually get um, out, uh, automated. Mm -hmm. They get made redundant, and now suddenly, like, well, my skills are old. And that's what another yeah. thing we talk about, like, how do you make sure that the skills you have are not the ones that some clever programmer is going to then program and sell to your company and yeah. basically put you out of business. Yeah. I think one thing one thing that's just popped into my head and it always pops into my head when I'm thinking about the future. Pizza. And... <laughs> no, not pizza. <laughs> Although now I am thinking, oh, I hate you. I'm trying to eat good at the moment. <laughs> um, no, is... Um, do you remember the Jetsons? Yeah. All right. I loved the Jetsons because I've always been a little bit of a sci-fi geek anyway. I mm -hmm. loved the Jetsons. And... Um, I have a vivid memory about watching the Jetsons and I, I must have been watching it with my dad. Mm. And th so this was in the mid nineties, must have been the mid nineties. And we were watching the Jetsons and they paid for stuff by signing for stuff. Yeah. That was it. That was it. No cash, no nothing. And I remember my dad saying to me, he was like, cash is going to be a thing of the past and all, you are only going to have to pay for stuff by signing for things. Yeah. We're already, past I mean, I mean the, cash, the cash thing hasn't gone, but I mean, I don't carry cash on me anymore. No. Um, and we've gone past the signing thing because now it is literally a case of tapping a button and holding your wrist up to something. Yeah. If you've got a watch or just getting your card out and go ding. So it's even quicker than signing for things. So I think one thing that I always say to people, like the future is here. Yes. It's happening. We're in it. Yeah. Everything that we have dreamed of as sci-fi nerds, if you're a sci-fi nerd or even just... <laughs> It had the slight inclination of, I wonder what the future's going to like. It's here. Like, don't kid yourself. It's happening. And if you are in a job that can be automated, please find something else to do quick. Just be aware of it because there might be aspects of your job that you know definitely can't be automated. Mm. We know, even if you like, we've got all this research that we're putting out there that might be kind of like scaremongering and make you think, oh my God, it's all going to pop. But actually... We know that when technology advances, there are jobs necessary to work alongside that technology. Uh -huh. Average is over is a great book to to read up on that sort of subject. But on the same on the same breath of that as well is that I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of average is over because he talks a lot about this need that we need to be able to work with technology. We know that yes. we're part man, part machine with our phones already, yeah. and I think that's the idea that actually it we. The next level of our advancement in terms of employment is actually being able to work with the technology. We know now how to create websites. We know now how to put a video out on YouTube and mm -hmm. influence somebody that way. And I think that's only going to continue. We know there's a massive need for digital upskilling of everybody. I think you can't go wrong with getting to understand technology, getting to understand the new platforms mm -hmm. that come out. So Yeah, and it's about I think it's about keeping your finger on the pulse. Mm. I think that's going to be such a big game changer for so many people. It's just keeping an eye on what technology is doing. I mean, and it changes too quick as well. It changes rapidly. Every, yeah. especially we know. Look how many updates come on an iPhone. Look how many updates yeah. come on your computer. You've got to update every single week. But if you're not kind of updating your mind on the ways that things are changing, then suddenly, before long, Internet Explorer doesn't load up. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's kind of like suddenly. Nobody uses Internet Explorer anymore, dude. Chrome, Jeez. whatever. <laughs> Chrome, whatever you want. But ultimately, you fall behind so much. That you're no longer working in that system uh -huh. so i think it's just that it's really important that you do be aware of these changes and they happen around people and you can talk to people about it 
And they don't even, like, they're probably the people that still go to the till, even though there's a machine over there that they don't want to touch. Because yeah. they're like, oh, actually, no, no, I'm not, I don't want to do that. It do looks you know complex. What? I find that really fascinating, actually, when I'm queued up in Sainsbury's. I would love to know the stats of how many people at a certain age use the uh, self checkout, how many people still would go to the till. Do you know what? I have noticed a massive correlation. It's the pensioners go to the till. And the, anybody below the age of 50 mm -hmm. goes to a self checkout. Yeah, and I think that's the danger as well. It's obviously some people, and it's not even just old people, because I think there's a lot of it's young not. people who are not willing to kind of move with the technology, but actually they're just basically like chopping off the legs, making themselves not be able to be um, efficient in that new changing world. Like how can you how can you do business in a world that's different and you don't have the skills? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, in short, automation's here. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. Yes. And and things are going to be automated. I think what's going to be interesting though is if you if you go again go to that BBC study and just have a look at different job uh different occupations. Kind of lines up a lot with what J John Danaher was saying in that previous episode about what's going to stick around is when people are dealing with humans directly. Yeah. Your customer service yeah. is not going to be automated for a long time till artificial intelligence gets good. Care as well, healthcare. So healthcare, look, like obviously we art. know we've got a massively aging population. There's a yeah. massive need for healthcare workers. Yeah. It's going to be people who know how to create the code for technology, create the code for AI to develop these virtual worlds that we're going to be swimming around in. Um, yeah. It's all these kind of <laughs> things that are going to be the popular things. We know that's what's going to happen, like... I think we know VR is is on the cusp of being a booming industry. PlayStation brought out mm -hmm. bringing theirs out. We've got Oculus Rift coming. I think it's a really interesting time, but I think it's from a lot of people, like those people who are still going to the counter to, to check out, I think it's a scary world. It's like, well, this is so far from what we've ever imagined. Mm. But again, like with every single change, there's humongous opportunity and it's just being, being brave enough in some ways to... To just have a little peek in to see what the behind the curtain, what could what are the opportunities? Yes, there's gonna yeah. be a massive load of flaws that come with this. There's gonna be people out of work, there's gonna be people who who don't have certain jobs that they can't get. But at the same time, we're on the kind of optimistic front about the internet and the future and the idea that actually maybe this is gonna mean that those shitty jobs that nobody wanted to do, now they can go and do better things with their lives, mm -hmm. they can focus on better jobs, or maybe they just get to work a lot less and spend more time with family or do hobbies yeah. or do sports or keep themselves healthy. Yeah. So you took... Uh, we've not got long left. Go but into it. We've can... touched on it, and I feel like we have to address it. Okay. VR. Yes. So... Virtual reality. <laughs> I have to admit, by the way, my opinion is slowly starting to shift. Cool. Right? Because we have discussed VR many times. And I have always been on the it's cynical end. Yeah, yeah. Not that, to clarify, I do think VR is going to be amazing when it's ready, but I'm not sure it's ready yet. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my reservation, is I feel like it's being rushed to market. But um, I am starting to hear that these, movement, these hand controllers are starting to surface through the one called the Vive, has got the hand controller, which means, because my thing about VR is I don't want it to just be 360 video because that's just a gimmick. Um, but if we've got these, if we can make things interactive, then I'm starting to, to shift. So I just wanted to put that caveat out there. My opinion is slowly starting to... That's uh, good to hear. Yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, talk VR, Jem, because you're much more... What do you want to... What, how, what sort of approach are you having? Because obviously John Danaher spoke a lot about uh -huh. this idea that it's going to be a great way for escapism. And mm -hmm. I mean, Gary Vaynerchuk recently mentioned, he's like, don't judge people's escapism. And I think it is going to be that next level of escapism. Mm -hmm. We know Facebook, are, Facebook obviously own Oculus Rift and they're yeah. going to get into this big time. And they know that the audience that are probably on Facebook are the people that are either browsing like articles online, mm -hmm. experiencing videos online, or maybe they're meeting friends online, or mm -hmm. maybe they're being marketed to online. And so all these things are going to be happening in VR. Uh-huh. But it's just depending, it's again on that cusp. Is it something that we now use for the, um, it's a next level of entertainment, of advertisement? Is it a deeper, more integrated into our mind version of that? Or is it actually going to be something that gives us experiences beyond our wildest imagination? Mm -hmm. But is there a danger to that? We know that there's so much, there's so much debate around it. I'm more on the cusp, but I think it's going to be like entertainment wise. We, I think there's, a, there's another lot of statistics that show that 
entertainment industries are booming. We know Netflix oh, are producing more time. than ever. Films big are coming time. out more often than ever. Marvel films are coming out every week. Like these things are happening over and over. So people are knowing. People know that they're being freed up of their time. People are also living with more, probably more cash a lot nowadays. People want to spend their money on experiences, especially that millennial generation. Mm. We're all about, we'd rather not have the house, have low costs and actually go on holiday a few times a year Mm -hmm. or go to the uh, cinema every week. So these are booming industries. And I think VR is really going to take advantage of the idea that they know that millennials especially love experiences. And the experiences we're going to have, there's been documentaries on about this, like even in terms of sex robots, in terms of... All these kind of things that are coming. <laughs> yeah. these, these are all coming, but these are all going to be new experiences. Oh, I want to go experience another place in the world. Okay, put on my goggles and I'm there. Mm-hmm. So I think it's fascinating. I can't really guess where it's going. I just know that it's going to be like any other platform like the internet. It's just going to be a more immersive experience of what we have, which then puts everything on another level of hyperdrive, really. Yeah, I think what's going to be interesting is to see what sort of jobs and career opportunities virtual reality creates. Mm-hmm. That's what's going to be interesting. And it's going to be interesting to see how easy it will be to build a career on virtual reality, whether or not you're going to need uh, IT skills and coding skills and stuff, or whether or not vi- virtual reality is going to be interactive enough that actually you don't need that and all you need is just to plug in. I, I think, yeah, I think and it's going to be... start to interact with that environment and dust for... I mean, like, in the same way that um, on, like, World of Warcraft in, like, China, whether or not this is true, I don't know, <laughs> but in China they say that you've got, like, the players that farm gold yeah. and their whole job yeah, is yeah. to generate gold yeah. on World of Warcraft in that economy and to build up characters and sell the characters off and, and all that sort of stuff and how, how, much, how much of a... Uh, opportunity there is to create a, a career in virtual reality on those sorts of things i think it's really guaranteed i think it's guaranteed that if there's services that are in the real, real world there'll be services that then apply to that virtual reality mm-hmm. world 100 percent. there's already that documentary the one was it the first life documentary that's i think available on netflix and it's about people who are already working in those um, those imaginary worlds mm-hmm. and i think a good thing to do is to kind of, I mean, it's probably not what people are going to actually go and do, but if you go and look at World of Warcraft, I've played it in the past. If you look at all these games where you're kind of, you do get that immersive experience even when you just sat there with your headphones on. Mm-hmm. And I think the same systems are going to apply in this virtual world. It's just going to be so much more intense because it's really taking all of our senses and really bringing stuff to life. So mm-hmm. I think I think there's massive opportunities there, but then some people might be like really pessimistic and say, what kind of world do we live in where we sit with a headset on and we go to work <laughs> And really, we're just sitting in our um, our shitty accommodation in a single bedroom house. Yeah. And I think another book that, if you kind of are interested in that, is check out Ready Player One mm-hmm. because that is a whole story about that scenario that looks into the future. That's kind of questioning: mm-hmm. Do kids go to school? And that's they put on their mask and that's it. They turn up and they're in the classroom and you can mute people. It's mm-hmm. a really fantastic book to kind of have a little peek into maybe where that future might lie. Yeah. Or if you're not a big reader, wait for the film. Oh, is it coming? Oh, yeah, it's coming out on film, yeah, isn't it? Being yeah. directed by, oh, I don't know, Steven Spielberg. I no didn't, biggie. I didn't know that. It'll probably be rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding, Stephen. I love you. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, so, sorry, I've got a really itchy nose. Me I too now. You been, made my nose really I'm sorry. itchy. <laughs> Everybody watches like, God, just blow your nose, Wayne. <laughs> but it's not, it's just itchy. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, we've kind of, we jumped into the VR thing, but I did want to make sure that we touched on it because I kind of feel like it was the elephant in the room when you're talking about the future right now. Um, I think it's elephant in the room, but I think it's an elephant that probably majority of people don't see. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of a, a very quick overview of what we think the future is going to be like. Um, <laughs> Literally like a tiny segment tiny, of it. <laughs> t- I mean, we talk about it all the time, so yes. it only felt right that we did an episode about it for you guys. So, let us know what you think, actually about the future in the comments on YouTube send us an email wayne at powerfulnonsense.com gem at powerfulnonsense.com or on our Twitter Twitter at Twitter pn room. underscore podcast just let us know name tags will come up again I guess yeah gem <laughs> will throw those in yeah it's all good <laughs> um, and also please give us a thumbs up on YouTube or a review on iTunes and hit the subscribe button on either because we'd love you to come back yep we'd love you to come back Um, So thanks very much for tuning in, guys. 
and um, yeah, the future's here. <laughs>